Last year, we began uh, a little bit of a different approach as a church body. We decided that we would begin our Sunday morning in our corporate gathering, with our corporate gathering, and then we would, we would leave this corporate gathering and we would go into our community groups. And here was the, the thought behind that, that we wanted our groups uh, to be um, um, sermon-based, if you will, that you would go into your community group and you would discuss um, uh, uh, this message and the verses that are provided to, to your leaders and that, that it would put us all on the same page and then that would trickle down even to our, our student ministry and our children and our preschoolers. And then we decided we would um, um, uh, provide reading plans for you and, and for all of us to read together throughout the week. And then we would preach on one of those verses or that idea for that week. And then we go into our community groups and, and we, would, we would do this again. And here, here was the thought. The thought is, is that, that it would cause us to engage in God's word all the more. So let me just encourage you with this as we do begin a year. Uh, a new year, that if you want God to do something in your life, if you want to see change happen in your life as a follower of Christ, engagement in God's Word is a must. If you neglect God's Word, those things that you want to see different or change or that closeness that you want to feel uh, uh, with, with God, that intimacy that God desires for us and has saved us to, the ability to even do that, if you neglect God's Word, then you won't see those things happen. Adley, if you also neglect God's church, you'll start to see some of those things not happen as well. And so my prayer for you, my prayer for, for me, for all of us as a, as a church is that we will be in God's word more this year. We'll be uh, uh, with the, the, the people more this year. We'll gather more this year and, and see what God does. Don't you want to see God move in this church? Look around and see it. find an empty seat. Find an empty section in a pew. Don't you want to see that seat filled? Don't you want to see that pew filled up? Don't you want to walk in and that one person that says, that's my seat, that seat is taken? Some of that will catch up to you in a minute. You'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. And others are like, he's talking about me. Yeah, talking about you. And so I hope that, that this year, as we continue this, this year, as we continue engaging God's Word together, that we'll start to see things happen more this year, and we'll start to see those personal changes take place, and then those corporate changes take place in the life of our church. So what are we doing this year? Last year, we read together Genesis through Revelation. We, we looked at the meta-narrative of God's Word, the big picture. What did God do? What does the Bible tell us? What is the story that's sort of woven through the entire uh, uh, scriptures, this, this library of, of historical documents that tell the story of God from Genesis to Revelation? What was God doing? And I hope that as you read with us and as you were here on Sunday mornings and involved in a community group, you started to see that God has set in motion since the, the, the fall of man, God has set in motion redemption, that the story is about a redemptive God. It's about a God of mercy. It's about a God of grace. It's about a God that desires to have relationship with his creation. And so we saw what God did this past year. And what we want to do this year is we want to, we want to see what we believe. Because we know what God has done and we believe God's word to be true, well, what are those foundational doctrines? What are those foundational truths that we say we believe in? These fundamental truths. And we're going to do them in a little bit of a, of a different way. Typical studies tell us this, that, that we spend 70 to 80 percent of our time in some form of communication. Of that time, we spend about 9 percent writing, we spend about 16 percent reading, we spend about 30 percent speaking, and listen to this, 45 percent of our time listening. Uh, wives, I know you're wondering if he's listening. Well, statistics say he's listening, all right? So we spend most of our time, 70 to 80%, in some form of communication. And most of that time is, is someone is speaking and you are listening. Studies also say that if you hear something, listen to this, if you hear something 7 to 20 times, you are more likely to believe it and you're more like, likely to think it is the popular opinion. 7 to 20 times, probably 7 times for, for, for women and 20 times for men, right? Oh. 
We are available for counseling. I'll just say it. No, I'm just. I found this statement. Uh, I found a blog uh, that American Express puts out, and they put it out uh, to their, their business uh, 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 folks. They put it out to anyone engaged in, in the business arm of their company. And here, here's what it said. A frequency of fewer than three messages is a waste of time. But a frequency beyond seven continues to have a cumulative benefit. Diminishing returns doesn't set in for a good while. You'll get tired of your ads long before your prospect will. Keep the message in front of the people. Whatever you are selling, whatever you want your, your, your people to do, your prospects to do, keep it in front of them, and they are more likely to engage. I found this interesting, thinking about what happens over the 20 times a person hears something. It says the first time you look at an ad, you don't see it. The second time, you don't even notice it. The third time, you're aware that it's there. The fourth time, you have this feeling sense that you've seen it before. The fifth time, you actually read the ad. The sixth time, you thumb your nose up at it. The seventh time, you get a little irritated with it, just like this list. Number eight, you say to yourself, here's that that ad again, and you're confounded by it. The ninth time you hear it, you wonder if you're missing out on something. The tenth time you hear it, you ask your friends and your neighbors if they have tried it or seen it. The 11th time, you wonder how the company's paying for all these ads. The 12th time, you start to think, ah, this might be a good product. The 13th time you see it, you start to feel that the product has value. The fourth time you see it, you start to feel uh, like you've wanted this product for a long time. The 15th time you hear it, you start to yearn for it because you can't afford it to buy it. The 16th time, you accept the fact that you'll buy it sometime in the future. Or the 17th time, you make a commitment to buy the product. The 18th time, you curse your poverty because you can't buy this product. The 19th time, you start to count your money and save it very carefully. And the 20th time, you buy the product. It's an interesting list, and I even find it more interesting that that list was written in 1885. (laughs) Centuries. Centuries, people have accepted the reality that if you hear something repeatedly, you get it. As a matter of fact, even historically in the church, dating back all the way to the first century, some even argued that this was the, 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 the way the apostles started teaching the doctrines of the Christian faith was through repeatedly putting the truths in front of people. Continually looking at followers of Christ, gathering together in corporate settings like this, and just repeating over and over and over these truths. Historically, the church would do this in in this form. It's called catechism. And I know that's a word that for some you might go, whoa, I thought that was a Catholic thing. Some of you hear that and go, cat of what? You know, it's like, what is going on? Well, it's simply this. It's simply a form of teaching the truths and doctrines of our faith through question and answer, repeated over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, catechism is borrowed from the Greek, and it means to make resound. It means uh, it, it carries this idea of an, of an echo. From the first century even till today, catechism has been employed to pass down the articles of faith or definitions of belief. And so what we're going to do this year is we're going to take this process, this repeated process, mostly found in the form of question and answer. And each week we're going to take a question and we're going to have an an answer for it. And throughout that whole week, that question and that answer is going to be placed out in front of us in various ways. As a matter of fact, I think this is really cool. You can get one of these door hangers out in Ministry Central there in in the the, the lobby area. You can get one of these hangers and you can hang it on your rear view mirror in your car. And so every time you drive, it's right there. It's got the question, it's got the answer, and then it's got the memory verse that we're going to be doing each week. We're investing a lot into this process. You can also take your phone. You can go to our app. Listen, if you're not using our app, and I I can't encourage you enough to, to download the Grand Avenue app and to use it Because it's in that app, you can find our reading plan. It's in that app, you can find audio to the verses that we're going to be doing. You can find even video of of us reading the verses where we just engage God's Word together. 
And so take advantage of these things this year and see what God will do as we engage in his word more this year even than we did last year. And so this morning we're going to begin, and the first set of questions, the first set of, the, uh, of a few weeks uh, of questions are going to be centered around God. Who is God? What do we believe about God? And we're calling this first section, Meet Your Maker. Because that's where it all begins. It all begins with your understanding of who God is and what God has done and the hope that he offers us as followers of Christ. And so here's the first question. We're just going to dive in this morning. The first question is, what is our only hope in life and death? Now let's read that together. You ready? One, two, three. What is? Here is the answer, that we are not our own, but belong to God. Let's read that together. One, two, three. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 8. Here's the verse for the week. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. What is our hope? Our hope in this life and the life beyond is that we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to God. And if you have any context in church, if you, if you were raised in, in, in church, then this is not a surprise to you. That what the Bible teaches is that we are his. We've been bought with a price. That God has pursued us and he has saved us and we are his. But this does require a little more unpacking. And my hope is, is that when we preach, my goal in preaching this year is that we will expound on these questions and these answers in such a way that it's an, it's an added resource to you hearing it and then buying into it, believing it, and then living it out. And so let's look at the question again. What is our only hope in life and death? Isn't this great news that the Christian has hope now and tomorrow? That the Christian has hope today and the Christian has hope uh, uh, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, 60 years from now. When you stand before God in eternity, if you are a follower of Christ, you stand in hope. But that hope is based on who we belong to. If you don't belong to God, you don't stand in hope right now and you don't have hope tomorrow. But if you are a follower of Christ and believers believe this, the Bible teaches this explicitly, that if you are a follower of Christ, you have hope right now and you have hope when it's all said and done. And that hope is Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. It's why we say 100 years from now, all that's going to matter is and so what is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong to God. Now, the answer brings about the struggle that mankind has dealt with since the garden and even a struggle that we continue to wrestle with today, and it is ourselves. We have a problem. Look at the person next to you and say, you got a problem. Go and do that. <laughs> Wives, this is your chance. I give you a lot of these, a lot of opportunities. And so the problem is this, if you belong to yourself, meaning if God is absent from your life, you have no hope. But if you are in Christ and God is in your life through Christ, then you have hope. And so we have to then pose the question, what's the problem with us? What's the problem with belonging to ourself? If you're not a follower of Christ, you have to be asking that. Well, what's, the, what's wrong with me? Well, you mean, you, I can't make my own decisions. I can't live my life the way I want to live my life. I can't do the things I want to do, handle life situations the way I want to handle life situations. And listen, for the Christian, the answer is no. Because we recognize that we have a problem. And that the problem with belonging to ourselves begins with this truth, is that we are broken. If you want to do it your way, it's going to be a broken way because we recognize that we are broken. Listen, let me say it this way. I don't trust myself. I, I don't trust myself to make the decisions that I need to make in my life 
that will do the things that God wants to accomplish in my life. I can't sit down and map it out myself. I need God to guide and direct. I don't trust myself. I was thinking about this, as I, and of course I could say so many different things about, about me and my life. And listen, you can say so many things about the way you're wired and the way you're bent. And as a believer, you will come to that conclusion that, man, I am so wired and I am so broken that no way, I, there's no way I can trust myself. If you've ever eaten lunch with me over a period of time, here's what's going to happen. Especially if you eat lunch with, with me with someone who eats lunch with me a lot. At some point, I'm going to order. Usually I want to go last. And I look at the menu the whole time. Everybody's talking. And I look at the menu, and the whole time I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to get. Even if I've been to that restaurant, there's only one restaurant where I always know what I'm going to get, and guess what it is? McDonald's. There we go. Hey, <laughs> Lord, I love it. But the, the, the waitress or the waiter will come around to me, and, and I'll make a, a, a decision. And, and let's just say somebody like a, like a Will who's eaten with me a lot, and we're together a lot, especially in the holidays, all that kind of stuff, just knows me. He'll make this comment. He'll say, you better hurry and leave before he changes his mind. <laughs> and a lot of times I change my mind. Or, or, or when the waitress leaves or the waiter leaves, I'm like, man, I should have got the burger. Got a salad with no dressing and carrots. What is going on? It must be, must be January the 8th, right? If I can't make a simple decision without struggling at a restaurant and a menu as to what to eat, well, I'm certainly not going to trust myself when it comes to the bigger picture of the things of life. I need help outside of myself. And so that means I need to find something, and something needs to come into my life in such a way that now guides me and directs me and gives me a blueprint as to how to live my life. And here's what I know now as a believer. Every time I've responded to life situations my way, listen, it has never gone well. It's true in every area of my life, as a parent, as a husband, as a friend, as someone who stewards finances and God has given me as a pastor, as a leader. Every time I've made decisions my way, it has never gone well. Here's why. Because the kind of brokenness that we have is a brokenness that will always take us on paths far from God. The inevitability of every person in this room, when you begin to make decisions your way, you begin to do life your way, here is the inevitable. Your brokenness has one direction, and it's away from God. And that's the kind of brokenness that we deal with. It's why Proverbs chapter 3 teaches us not to trust ourselves. It's why Proverbs chapter 3 tells us to not lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he will make our paths straight. But if we trust in ourselves, the opposite is true. If you lean on your own understanding and decide to do life your way, your path is not straight. Your path is a winding road away from God. And that is a scary road to be on. Listen to Romans chapter 3 as the Apostle Paul describes the reality of human brokenness. He says, what then? Are we any better off? This is verses 19 through, or 9 through 18. Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. The Apostle Paul is, is painting this picture for those that are listening that we're all, on the same, uh, we're all on the same boat when it comes to brokenness. And when you think about your life and you think about the difference between you and, say, someone who doesn't know God, the difference between the two is not that you're awesome and they're not. The difference is, is you have hope in Christ and they don't. They've not put their faith and trust in Jesus. And so it makes it not about you. And he wants them to hear, listen, we're all in the same playing field. No one can look at another person and say, oh, I'm better than you. As believers, we're humbled by the fact that the one thing and the only thing that separates me from a dying world is that Jesus has made me alive. I didn't make myself alive. Amen? Amen. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. 
Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers, venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. And the path of peace that they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's how broken we are before Christ invades our life. I find it interesting that the Apostle Paul writes this way as to given his, his past. I mean, the Apostle Paul is writing out of a personal experience. He understands the depravity of a man outside of Christ. He gets it. He knows that before Jesus, he was a persecutor of the church. He knows that before Jesus, he, he condoned the, the killing of, 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 of Christ followers, that he had one aim, and that, that was to be zealous for things not of God. He, he missed the message of Christ until Christ invaded his life on that road and called him into a life of ministry and used him as a conduit by the power of the Holy Spirit to give us a third of the New Testament. Used him to, to start the church, greatest church planner ever, missionary journeys everywhere, dangerous things. I mean, this was a man before he met Christ, was far from God. And so as putting his faith and trust in Jesus, he's reminding the Roman listeners the church in Rome, those uh, Greeks that, that had not believed in Christ yet. Listen, don't look at each other and think we're all uh, on, on, on different playing fields. We're on the same field. The difference is, is I know Jesus because this is who I was before, and then Christ invaded my life. And here's what we know as followers of Christ. We know that our brokenness has been mended because of the way Jesus lived his life, the obedience that he displayed as he walked on this earth, Emmanuel, God with us, puts on flesh, lives the life we couldn't live, dies the death that we should have died, and he makes us right before God because of his life. And so that means when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, guess what doesn't go away totally? My flesh. This this condition, this nature of brokenness that rears its head from time to time. That Christians are not without sin. That we do at times respond to life the way we want to respond to life. We do at times do things not God's way. And here's what I know. I know that if you're a follower of Christ, that's going to last for a short time. At some point, you're going to go, whoa, what is going on? What is happening? Things don't seem to be right. And then you come to this conclusion that you're trusting in yourself and you've abandoned those things that God has called you to, to do to show trust in him, to know what he wants for you. And so the reason our only hope in life and death is that we belong to God and not ourselves, the reason that we don't trust ourselves is because we're broken. And we know that as followers of Christ. The second thing, the reason we don't trust ourselves and the problem with ourselves is that our wisdom is unwise. Now some of you, you're like, yeah. Some of you might be like, whoa, what? What? I consider myself a wise person. Well, if that wisdom is rooted in a knowledge of Christ and Christ alone and that in your boasting you boast in Jesus, well, that's wise wisdom. But if you begin to trust in your own human logic and your own wisdom and you start to sort of leave and get away from God's wisdom, the whole thing is going to mess up. And all of this started in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. When they came to believe because they heard something, they came to believe that God was hiding something from them. And that was the dialogue that they had with the serpent. They had this dialogue where the serpent is convincing them to where they came to believe that, that God's really not wanting you to be like him. You're not going to die if you eat this fruit and disobey God. As a matter of fact, something better is going to happen, and God is hiding this from you, that your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God. 
Unfortunately, their eyes were open, their nature was changed, and brokenness ensued. And what happened from that point on is an imputed unrighteousness throughout the generations. Like the reason that we are broken is it starts in Genesis chapter 3. And while we're not tempted with this fruit in the garden, what we struggle with today, what's placed in front of us as Christians every single day, the fruit that's placed in us is how do we, how do we live our life in, in, in areas like sex, substances, lying, anger, greed, marriage, children, money, church, reading God's word. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Those are the things that are placed in front of us on a daily basis, and we have a choice to make as followers of Christ. That choice, that choice is, is I'm either going to do this God's way or I'm going to do it my way. If you do it God's way, God has promises that come along with that. And those promises are paths that lead to holiness and righteousness, intimacy with God. If you choose to do it your way, well, that is a path that has a destination, and it's a predetermined destination. And God has promised you if you give yourself over to those things and you live your life in these areas, you take that fruit and you eat it, the predetermined destination is a path away from God. It's a path away from God. And so our wisdom it, it, it's unwise. And we're tempted all the time with it. Think of it this way. You ever, you ever sat at a red light late at night and no one's around? I know, you know why you're laughing. It's because we all think the same thing. We're like. And this is why I say don't put our church sticker on your car, by the way. But anyway. <laughs> And you start to rationalize. You're like, well, there's no one around. I mean, it's late. I don't see a police officer. No one's going to see. Those cameras don't even work. They just put them there to scare us. <laughs> so I may, I may just slip, slip through. You're like, Brad, is that wrong? Yes. <laughs> but we do that with the big things in life. We do that. And listen, here's the deal. If we start slipping in those things, doesn't it open us up to start when these, these things come to, into our life? These life-changing things. I mean, listen, if you slip through a red light at midnight, your life's not going to change probably. But maybe if you compromise there when no one's looking and you're by yourself and it's late at night, which they say that's where character's really displayed, when no one is looking, well, then you open yourself up to, to other things. Then you compromise here and you compromise there and you start choosing to do it your way and not God's way. And then your life just continually gets to this place where you feel distant. When I meet with believers, when, when someone wants to meet with me, and we start to talk about life and they start to, in their own words, describe this feeling of just distance from God, Almost all the time, it's because there's a sin and then there's a lack of discipline when it comes to the things of our faith. When I think about my life and those seasons in my life where I felt distant and I've struggled, sin and a lack of discipline. And so that's the reason I don't trust myself is because I'm broken. And my wisdom is unwise. Look what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 19 and 21 says. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. Here's what the Apostle Paul just said. What he wrote was that even your knowing God doesn't come from your wisdom. Your knowing God comes from what was preached through his word. That God has to invade your life because your wisdom will never choose God. So you have to hear 
the truth of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit has to invade your life. Here's the point. Our wisdom will not lead us to Jesus. And that's a scary thing. The reason I don't trust myself when it comes to making the choices and decisions that I need to make, I need to go to God's word, is because my wisdom will not lead me to Jesus. Our wisdom will always lead us to ourselves. Why, do you, why would you run the red light at midnight? You're impatient. You gotta be somewhere. You told the wife you'd be home an hour before that. Well, that's your fault. Don't run the red light. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 through 31. God has chosen what is insignificant and, des and, and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his presence. You see, if you come to Christ and you live this life your way and it's about your wisdom, well, guess what you get to do? You get to boast. And you get to boast about the choices you made. You get, to, you get to boast about the fact that you made the right choice when it came to God, when all the while it's God that pursued you. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, listen to this, boast in the Lord. The only wise things that happen in my life happen when I obey God. And so the problem with trusting in myself is that I'm broken. The problem in trusting in myself is that my wisdom is unwise. So then if our only hope in life and death is to not trust in ourselves, but to trust in God, or this, this, that I belong to God, not myself, if that is my only hope in life, well, then it's logical that I shouldn't trust in myself, which begs the question, what's the logic of belonging to God? Let me give you two things really quick. Number one, because he's our maker. It makes no sense to deny the very one that created the universe with his voice. Deny him to then do it the way you want to do it. He made you for a purpose. There's a reason he created you and wired you the way you are. And to abandon that and to try to make yourself something that you were not made to be, which is disobedient to God, is not wisdom. It's very unwise. You have something in your house that you've tried to use for other than its created purpose. It doesn't always go great. It doesn't always go well. And so the reason and the logic of trusting in God and not ourselves is because he is our maker. If you've read the story of Job, Job has this tragic, tragic beginning. He loses everything, wife, children, house, livestock, I mean everything. Has every reason to look at God and say, why? Every reason to curse God. And then he starts to get this advice from friends, and they start talking to him with, with their human wisdom. And then God, in Job chapter 38, he sort of speaks up, and here's what he says. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Here's what he said. Who is the one who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. Listen, if God ever starts his conversation with you with that, you better buckle up. <laughs> when I question you, you will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its dimension? Certainly you know. Who stretched and measuring line across it? Who supports its foundation or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? This is God giving Job a divine spanking. And it would behoove us to never forget that we weren't there when all this was created. None of, this, none of this is ours. 
And our life certainly isn't ours. And so the logic to to belonging to God, not trusting in ourselves, is we are not God. Did you know that you are not God? Man, look at the person next to you. You are not God. Go ahead and tell them that. Wives, I'm giving you lots of chances this morning. It'll be a great year. It just makes sense. This is all his, and he designed it a certain way, and he's given us the blessing of guiding us through his word by the power of the Holy Spirit to show us how to live. And here's what I hope you found if you were with us last year as we read through the word. I hope you found this, that our God is a good God. There's a passage that I always love, and it, it talks about, you know, what, what son goes to his father and asks for bread, and the father gives him a snake. That'd be a horrible father. It'd go viral, but that'd be a horrible father, right? Well, the point is, is that our God is a good God. God is not going to guide you and tell you how to live while holding behind his back something that he's hiding from you that's going to harm you. Say it this way. You can trust God. You can trust that God loves you. Let me say it this way. You can trust that God loves you more than you love yourself. That if you were to sit down and you were to write out your life and you were to, you were to span it out and you were to set goals and you were to have this dream life, whatever it is, it's nothing compared to what God wants to do in your life. As long as you separate all, all human wisdom you stop thinking about the American dream. You start thinking about, stop thinking about the big house and the money and all these things that are fleeting that Jesus teaches moth and rust and will destroy. Thieves break in and steal. You, you remove the temporary and start thinking about the only things that will matter a hundred years from now. You will never be able to write your life better than the way God has written it. We can trust God because he's our maker. And listen to this, we can trust God because he's our savior. Listen to what God did, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Somebody say amen. amen. God did that for us. And what this verse tells us and many other verses throughout the scripture teaches us explicitly is that there is no hope without Christ. No hope for today. No hope for tomorrow. Listen, only Christ can save me. Only Christ can save you. Only Christ can make you righteous. Only Christ can make you right before God right now. Only Christ can give you purpose. He is our Savior. And it's in Christ that God showed the world his love. Isn't that what John 3.16 teaches us? We've learned it since we were children. We've heard it over and over and over again. You know why you know John 3.16 by heart? It's because you've heard it over and over and over and over again. Let's prove it. Let's just say John 3.16 together. One, two, three, go. For God so loved the world. I love the Christian Standard Version, which is what I preach from. I love the, the, the way it, it, it translates. It says, for God loved the world in this way. That he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world in this way. That's what God has done for us. And he's done it, and it should be enough for us to say, I can trust God. He loves me. He's my maker. He's my savior. He's a good God. His life for me is better than my life for me. And that gives me hope. And that's why our only hope in life and death is that we don't belong to ourselves, but to God. That's why we have hope now, and that's why we have hope tomorrow. And so my prayer this morning for you is that one, you'd be filled with hope, 
that whatever you walked into these doors with, that you'd be encouraged by the truth that a God loves you and that he cares for you and that you can start to live your life God's way right now. Think, think of this question as you leave today. What, what in your life, what part of your life have you functionally forgot that you belong to Jesus? What's that area of your life that, that functions in such a way that you don't belong to Jesus? That functions in self, such a way that you've forgotten that you belong to Jesus? Start there. Begin to address that now. Start living your life God's way in that area today and watch what God does. As followers of Christ, we have to wake up every day and we have to choose to live life God's way. And we have to deny our flesh and the temptations and the fruit of life that gets thrown out in front of us. And we have to always know how to do life God's way. And that means that we're in his word. We know what it says and we respond accordingly. And so for believers today, have hope. Live in hope. Continue to trust God. If you're a follower of Christ this morning, and listen, your response to this is like, man, I know there's some areas in my life that, that function as if I've forgotten that I belong to Jesus. Repent, call it out, and start living life the way you know God has called you to live. I know as a believer myself, as I follow Jesus, I know that those are times in my life where, where my flesh rears its head, where, where I live my life my way. And what I need is people around me to talk to and to confess to and to bring into my life to help me as I navigate the brokenness of my own flesh. If that's you this morning, you're a follower of Jesus, and there are these areas that function as if you forgot that you belong to Jesus and you need a little help, I want to encourage you to reach out for help. You, you, can, you can talk to us. We'd, we'd love to help you. Any of our pastors or ministers, anyone uh, uh, that's on our staff would love to help you. Maybe you have a relationship with one of us. Reach out. Or maybe you don't. You want to talk to me. Uh, take one of those red Connect With Us cards. Fill it out right on the back. I need a pastor and minister to call me. Place it in a black box. We'll call you. We'll set up a time, and we'll work together. Isn't that the great thing about the body of Christ? When we're together, we carry one another's burdens. It's why Hebrews says, don't neglect this because you need it. Or maybe this morning you're not a follower of Jesus. You've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Let me just say the most important decision a person will ever make is what they believe about Jesus. And this morning you are here and you're hearing this and you're hearing that God is a good God. You're hearing don't live your life your way. Live life God's way. God's way is better than your way. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And it's all done through a relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have a relationship with Christ, we would love to talk to you today about what it means to be a follower of Christ. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus today. And for the first time in your life, walk out of these doors with purpose and meeting and be on a path of holiness and righteousness and living a life you never dreamed you would live, doing things that will echo in eternity. Why? Because our only hope in this life and death is that we belong to God and not ourselves. If you belong to yourself, you have no hope. But what God is doing this morning through his word is he's extending his hand to you and he's showing you hope that's found in Christ. And he's wooing you through the power of the Holy Spirit to himself. Would you put your faith and trust in Jesus today? In just a moment, I'm going to pray and uh, we'll respond uh, with, with worship. And then uh, Don will come up. He'll give us some parting words and some instructions as we go into our community groups. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you want to do that today. When Don dismisses us, I'll be hanging around down front. I would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ, how to follow Christ, and how to put your faith and trust in Jesus today. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, I do pray. I pray for this year as we as a church body come together and we just start thinking about these truths, these doctrines, these confessions of our faith that are all rooted in what we know about your word, that God will begin to change us more. And that because we're, we're giving ourselves over to your word, God, you'll begin to work in our lives, in our church. We'll, we'll grow closer to you and we're sanctified. We'll start to see those, those chains that, that are wrapped around us that we wrestle with, that sin in our life. We'll start to see those things break. And we'll give you all the glory and we'll boast in you and not in ourselves. 
Lord, I pray this morning for anyone that's never put their faith and trust in you, that they won't let anything hold them back from making the one decision that gives them hope in this life and hope in the after. And that's putting their faith and trust in you. God, we're thankful of how you love us, how you've displayed your love for us. And we worship you because of it. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.